since the light went off, I think the show must go on. <laughs> um, so we decided to split this panel in two parts because uh, it's a bit uh, easier. Uh, so we are starting, uh, first of all, uh, this is a panel related to the idea of post-privacy. And uh, we are starting now with uh, uh, the moderation of, uh, from Gregor Sedlak with Tante or better. Uh, Jürgen Goiter and MS Pro or Michael Seaman. I don't know if you prefer to be mentioned with your nickname or your dear name, so better to say both. And uh, then the second part, uh, uh, I will moderate uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Weizen Seaman group, especially Dania Vasivel and Yula Oliver, the Taria, and then we will have uh, at the end a common discussion. So I think it's better to leave the discussion all at the end also because uh, would be interesting uh, to connect the different uh, point of view, both the one that there will be in this first part of the panel and the second one that will still deal with the similar topics, but uh, uh, more related to an artistic perspective. So um, just I would like to introduce a bit uh, briefly, also to connect with the previous panel. And uh, because I, I think it's also uh, important to uh, make you understand that, so of course, even if these panels look uh, uh, all a bit uh, different in the topic and also in the people that we are inviting that are coming from different field work, uh, then I, see, uh, I think we should also try to um, imagine them as conceptually linked. So, for example, before uh, we spoke about the strategy of uh, sustainability and disruption, now we are speaking <coughs> about post-privacy, uh, but I would say in this idea of post-privacy, somehow we are also speaking about disruption because uh, um, we, are, uh, we will try also to analyze the topic, uh, uh, also considering that uh, if we speak about uh, uh, networking today and uh, uh, like methodology of uh, creating networks, uh, then we are also leaving uh, a kind of shifting between uh, um, like a, a situation in the past where we could consider that the issue of the privacy was really considered in a certain way, especially in the hacker culture, and now the things are really changing because uh, uh, many people are using social media, uh, there are a lot of different uh, channels of communication that are interviewing, so um, I believe that it's also important that we start to redefine what privacy is, especially also to re relating it to the concept of openness. And the idea of openness could be both seen from a hacker perspective, but also from an artistic perspective. That is also what we will do after. But uh, just to introduce briefly, Gregor, um, I'm really happy we are doing this thing together. Gregor Sedlak is one of the co-founders of Seabase. Or like the, how would you define yourself? Like the uh, visual archi architect, uh, visionary. I, I don't remember. Okay, this is bad. <laughs> but still, you contribute uh, in the project. And um, so we already collaborated before, actually, Transmediale already collaborated before with Seabase when last year we did our barbecue. And also, Seabase uh, has always been part of. Uh, I mean, for some times of the Forspiel, so the events before the festival, so the pre-program of Transmediale. So, for example, also this year, there have been uh, uh, events at Seabase that Gregor curated uh, that was uh, connected also with uh, the program of Transmediale. So after uh, this uh, event, we started to speak together and say in which way we could collaborate in the future because of course, also started to think about the resource. Uh, I mean, we are also really interested here in analyzing hacker perspective. And so it came really spontaneous to start to discuss together. And uh, then in our discussion, we enter into this discourse of post-privacy that personally I didn't know uh, was taking this kind of uh, um, paths uh, uh, in Germany. I think uh, now you will explain well, the background, uh, and I think it's really interesting uh, uh, to bring this discourse here because uh, it's of course uh, something that's uh, developed a lot in Germany, this uh, prospecting of post-privacy, but it's also something that is related to a broader discussion. I mean, as I say, how we conceive a network, how we conceive freedom of information, and also the discourse of openness, and our presence both online and offline 
also in terms of uh, uh, interacting with other people and the limits of our freedom and so on. Um, so I think now I will leave the word to you and you can introduce better our speakers. Then we'll come back with uh, uh, Dania and uh, Julian. Yeah, thank you, Tatiana. Um, before I uh, introduce the both uh, uh, guests here on the podium, um, both privacy uh, is a kind of attitude um, to endorse, to um, work with the new paradigm of social media and network in uh, another sense uh, which is not, um, yeah, which is a different to what, uh, to the critical approach that the IT community or the net community, uh, um, especially the, C the CCC was, uh, uh, stands for, uh, stood for the last uh, 30 years, but it is a attitude which is um, mostly coming from uh, people from the Chaos Computer Club. And so this is like a uh, internal um, uh, clash of, of cultures. And there's a specific ironic turn because the Chaos Communication, uh, the ca uh, Chaos, sorry, uh, Chaos Computer Club um, was also a different approach to the counterculture in Germany in general. Um, what really, um, I'm really pleased that uh, two of the um, main protagonists of the uh, movement and the discussion are uh, sitting next to me, which is on the one hand Tante, and he is, yeah, please give him applause. <laughs> And he is one of the um, organizers of this loosely um, network and group of people who call themselves uh, Spackeria, which is a, um, the, the whole name is the Datenschutzkritische Spackeria, uh, which is a provocation in itself. And, uh, what, what is the meaning? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, the, the problem is, it's, uh, probably uh, Tante will uh, explain it later. Um, data um, protection critical, this is in, in a, a very uh, crude manner, uh, a direct um, a translation, but spackeria is a pejorative term and probably it mean, means, uh, it comes from, from uh, a term of schickeria in Germany which is uh, uh, some kind of milieu of the rich and well um, and beauty uh, who are os, os, mm, who are trying to to show their richness to all the other people and uh, feeling uh, good by by um, uh, getting uh, scenes it, there's a, a exhibit um, oh, sorry I'm I'm lost um, but <laughs> the um, uh, a spuck is um, something which is in uh, English a spook, and everybody of you know that uh, the term spook is one of the most dangerous uh, words you can use in academic um, context. And on the other hand, there is MS Pro, and he is not, or he sees himself not as part of the group because he he is a force for himself. He won't. A force of nature. Yeah, he is a force of nature, and he wouldn't be uh, uh, associated to any, uh, to no group than uh, himself. But uh, so, uh, many of his um, ideas and of his posts and uh, his talks are um, uh, spark sparking this uh, discussion, and so he's in a broader sense. He is, he's getting associated with this uh, whole movement, and yeah, uh, to so 
to see what uh, the 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 um, I'm going um, because we had the 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 question how many people are from uh, Germany and uh, it was the, the minority so probably um, I've present uh, I prepared some slides uh, to bring you the big picture of uh, the last 50 years of German <laughs> counterculture and uh, there is a comprehensible part of uh, chaos uh, computer club in it and um, you will see for yourself so the wall is a good th thing to start because um, in East Germany as well as in West Germany critical Marxist theory wasn't um, welcome. In East Germany the critical Marxist theory was dissident literature and it was really dangerous to read them or because it was absolutely um, uh, well, nearly impossible to get this literature. And in West Germany, it wasn't welcome either because any Marxist literature was the literature and the theory of the enemy. And this enemy was, in, uh, this was an opponent uh, strictly um, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, which is a difference to any other European country like Italy or France, where the uh, Communist Party could take their part of the political spectrum. Have you ever um, thought why is Munich so important in Germany? You must know that uh, in the early 60s, um, Berlin wasn't so attractive like it is probably today. So um, Schwabing is or was the Prenzlauer Berg of the 1960s. And there were some riots, Schwabinger Krawalle. And it was a first forecast of something like a um, counterculture because people just wanted to have party on the streets at night and the police oppressed these uh, movements with um, all their violence. And for the Germans, the assassination of John F. Kennedy was really a nightmare because they were, they had the idea that there is one good leader after they had followed the bad leader. So it is not only the beginning of the American nightmare, um, it, for, for the German population, it was really a, um, uh, a, bad, a bad day. But for the younger people, there was, with the Beatles and the Fab Four, there was um, some hope. And the first global um, pop culture, which influenced the whole generation who was listening to the Beatles, they had something in common, and it was a clear defined generational gap. The assassination of Malcolm X in 1965 is, um, I think, uh, could, ha could ha uh, not so much be um, known in the uh, mid-1960s in West Germany. Uh, but in the 90s, uh, it was more uh, obvious um, because the hip-hop culture uh, was the, the tray where the the um, significance of Malcolm X came to the academic cultural studies. Then, in West Germany, there was the APO, the Extra-Parliamentarian Opposition. And they were um, opposing against the Grand Coalition, which is in the, the German systems when the two big parties Conservative, CDU, CSU, and the Social Democrats, SPD, are going together and probably have a more than two-third um, majority in the parliament. So they can um, uh, do 
constitutional changes. And there was one a change in, con in the constitution which was really pivotal for uh, the whole younger generation because um, they had to, uh, to uh, integrate or amend a uh, emergency state law or martial law uh, to the constitution because in the years before that um, Germany was under the uh, theoretical emergency law and uh, martial law of the uh, Allied forces, France, uh, France, USA, and the UK. So after they are resigning these last resort of foreign uh, sovereignty over the West German state, there was a gap and the Grand Coalition had the possibility to fill this gap by their vast majority in parliament and the young uh, generation saw in this uh, martial law and uh, uh, a first step of fascism uh, we uh, entering the political scene because everything what's written down in emergency state uh, legislation is nasty and this is uh, part of the game when there is emergency or um, war. Then, uh, June 2nd, in 1967, which was the year of Summer of Love in California, in Germany, it was the, um, the beginning of the whole protest uh, generation because um, a, a young student was shut down at the occasion of the protests against the visit of the Shah of Persia. And this whole thing went uh, terribly wrong. German police um, officers and, and uh, staff, uh, together with uh, some, some guerrillas from, from the Persian um, Secret Service on uh, foreign ground uh, attacked uh, students here in Berlin and a, um, a student was killed and this was the um, uh, moment for uprising. In 1968, which is on global scale a, a year of revolution, if you see Berkeley the Chicago Democratic Convention riots, if you see the uh, Paris May with Daniel Rouge and the goal is leaving the, uh, the country, uh, then there was the, as the attempt to assassinate uh, Rudi Dutschke, which then followed here in Berlin by the attack of the Springer uh, Publishing House. You had the uh, uh, Prager Frühling, the, the, uh, I don't know the English names of Prague uh, Spring. Then you had the um, even uh, the Cultural Revolution in China, and some people said no. The private is much more important. Privacy is the first uh, category of the political. And this is the Kommune one. And forgot anything what we have ever have seen of um, Paris Hilton or other it girls, Uschi Obermeier and uh, his and her friend um, Rainer Langhans. They were really the glamour couple of these days. And they all, they are the blueprint for every exploitation of privacy till today when you have these uh, formats in TV or in talk shows. And in a way, they can be seen as the mothers of post-privacy, of bringing the personal life as a state of, um, as a political statement. The other people uh, of the younger generation, 
they followed Willy Brandt and his statement to, um, to, to make more democracy. And they started a long march through the institutions and most of them, they um, are now are going into, uh, into pensions. And, uh, but there's a few people who are not going this reformist way. Uh, probably more the Bonnie and Clyde uh, side of the action. People of the Munich uh, milieu of the Schwabing riots, as well as the Commune One uh, guys, all people from this uh, early 1960s background. Rainer Werner Fassbinder also in this part and the Red Army uh, faction, um, they followed a military uh, path and thought they could uh, in ignite a, a, revol a world revolution uh, in Germany. But they, probably there was more uh, the radical chic than the political statement because the Willy Brandt government really had a colossal um, reform agenda and they uh, formed something like uh, later was called the Model Deutschland and it was impressive and it was immediately uh, f to see for everybody that uh, uh, fundamental change was in the first uh, half of the 1970s. So the, the terrorists came back with the Black September um, attack on the Summer Olympics, which was a real uh, face, a problem for, uh, for the face value of the German state because it was epic fail and um, it is part of the international internationalization of the terror, which is uh, important in the association with the RAF. The oil shock of 1973 really showed the limits of growth, although this embargo was a political embargo by OPEC to support the, Arabi uh, the uh, Arabic nations against Israel in the Yom Kippur War. Then there was the downfall of Willy Brandt's administration and the depression was on the economic side after the oil shock and it was personally and mentally in Willy Brandt's psyche. Um, and on the other hand, he was forced to do anti-extremist laws. So many people are in the institutions but they were compromised with earlier extremist activities in the APO or other uh, organizations, so they were expelled from the um, public services, and this was really a, a great um, uh, conflict. The internationalization of the terror then p came to the Stockholm Syndrome, which is in, it's, it's a double sense because the left-wing counterculture was on the one side uh, against the terror, on the other side they had a certain rest of sympathy and solidarity, but in the end they were uh, mentally or metaphorically in a Stockholm syndrome with the, R uh, with the RAF. And on the pop, Fancher, there is the punk explosion, whereas Wolf Biermann was banned from the GDR, which is re really important because um, this was for all people in East Germany, for all the artists, a sign that nothing will ever change. The system won't uh, liberalize. Yeah, the terror then came to the absolute uh, apocalypse because it's called the Deutsche Herbst, which is the mental uh, paradigm. And uh, in this aftermath 
of this uh, double incident of a kidnapping of a VIP person of the German economy, economy and of the of a airplane, uh, the whole um, left wing uh, left wing uh, community was in depression. Several months later, they collect to into the Tunix um, Congress, and at this um, Congress, there was the first encounter with post-structuralism, Foucault, Deleuze, and Guattari. Uh, I know Foucault was there, and the Tageszeitung as a project of a own means of public publishing the um, a counter uh, um, communication was um, established. And in this uh, context, there were the roots of the Chaos Computer Club. In 1979 is the year the first year of, now it's the year of the first anti-modernist uh, revolution. And um, it's on the same side, the collapse of the Soviet empire, which is with the invasion of Afghanistan. From the um, collapse of the terrorist movement, the squatter community said, okay, we want to have local, um, parts of resistance where we can do uh, our own life uh, without oppression of the state. And we don't do the uh, global revolution things anymore. And the CCC in 1981 was founded in the same year when Computer World came out from Kraftwerk. And it's a new paradigm because it's the um, endorsement for technology for the computer, which was till then a critical technology owned by the state. It was the bad technology, it was the Big Brother technology of 1984, and with this um, a double uh, co with this coincidence, I think this is the uh, interesting uh, part of it all. I uh, have to go straight to the things. The Bundesverfassungsgericht, the, very, the Federal Constitutional Court, then made the um, fundamental right to informational self-determination. This is something like the habeas corpus of every um, internet and liber uh, liberalization um, uh, movement because now there is a, a certain fundamental right you can uh, rely on. The CCC then had their first instant hits like the BTX hack and later on they had some things about freedom of speech which really was funny because it's about penis verletzung by masturbation with Staubsauger and I don't like to um, um, to translate. Chernobyl was then the uh, down f um, the end of the Atomstadt, which was also uh, a big fear that uh, the freedom could be um, um, could be um, destroyed by the uh, by the security um, measures that have to be t taken to make it secure. The Nasahak techno brought a new idea of um, machine-made music. Then there was the KGB hack of the CCC, which was really a, a, a pitfall for them um, uh, because they were um, compromised with the secret services of the, of the Soviet Empire. And 1990, there was the beginning of the of a unification of German hackers, of East German hackers and the CCC, 
which was a West German organization, and it formed the really elitist CCC of Berlin, which is now uh, the most um, prominent of all the CCC sub uh, um, communities. Okay, this is uh, the open source movement is relatively clear. We came to the web. This is fu funny. In 1994, this was decriminalized. The CCC had some um, public radio. CBOS came out and there was some strategic partnership between CCC and CBase. The GSM hack showed that the mobile phone world isn't secure anymore. Uh, the annual congress came to Berlin. Then there was the real, the Woodstock of hacker community, the first chaos communication camp. And then there was the first dot-com bubble. The founder died of one of the founding figures of CCC died. And this was in the um, direct uh, related to the, so it was in the 9-11 in the uh, aftermath, uh, the project Blinking Lights then put some um, positive energy into the, um, into the world. The next year was defined by to protect the freedom of hacking against all the security state elements now deployed by the security authorities. There was a first more black hat oriented fraction of this, uh, of hacker culture uh, called Phenolit and Dark Labs. Uh, they made really se serious security things. Uh, then later for Windows Vista, Ajax brought us the web 2.0 then there was the, the best surrounding um, speech ever by uh, Rob Gronkreib and Frank Rieger of the CCC, which was really um, s inspiring all the hacker community to, to get it on uh, with a second attempt, um, which meant the voting machines uh, were f fighted the hackerspace movement came alive and a next more punk oriented attitude hacker culture um, came from the fortune universe that sensula brought the political part of the movement into the pirate party and then there were three major strikes the bundesverfassungsgericht um, killed the voting machines, they killed the data retention, they killed the online surveillance. It was a victory on, whole, uh, on all fronts. The CCC has taken world domination again. And then there was the SPAC Zero, the Datenschutzkritische Spackeria, and they spoiled it all again. And yeah, the fight is again open. Please, Tante. I would say we were sorry, but we really were not. Um, as you've seen with this, um, you got to tell me when I have to finish to give MS Pro some time for his talk. Um, the if you see, Germany is a special country because it spawned from a fascist movement. We had the the National Socialist State here. Then we've seen the different uh, very restrictive <coughs> government. Uh, tendencies that we've seen with surveillance, pushing back against protest, even in West Germany that claim to be very free. And obviously that that formed the perception of many of the people in the CCC who defined themselves very much as a group that was pushing back against the state, against their surveillance and their anti-freedom movements. Um, but they kind of stopped at some point and the world didn't. The world changed and how people interacted changed. And nowadays, 
if I look at my life, I basically do everything that any any reasonable CCC person would tell you not to do. I I published my location. I checked in here when I came here, so people could see I was here, and it w uh, it was really neat, and it it is really helpful for me to do so to meet new people. I. I publish my income, so whoever needs to know how much money I make or have can just see that. I publish a lot about myself, sort of as a comment on what many other people do. I am a publishing extremist, if you want to see it like that. I basically publish anything about me. Other people don't go that far, but if you look how average people, how your parents, your, your brothers and sisters use tools like Facebook, like Twitter, like whatever, they publish a lot about themselves. And the, the, the consensus is, that is stupid, that is bad, the government will get you, they will use that to hunt you down and to find out that you're a bad person. You will not get a job because you had fun at a party and some guy took a picture of it. Um, that is the common consensus that we, we operate on and that most people will also reproduce. If you ask them, should you publish po uh, photos of parties on Facebook, they will tell you, no, that is stupid because I will never get a job. Uh, and then they do. And they, they publish their pictures and they still get jobs, obviously, if there are some. Um, we've, we see a, a big difference between how people act online and how they claim they should act online. And that is, if, if you see such a big difference between what people claim to be right and how they behave, that is always interesting because things seem to change. Um, in my perception, what people say is what they learned and what they've been taught for many, many years. And how they act is uh, influenced by the potential they see through the internet and so through this, this basically null cost publishing today if you want to publish if you want to publish to 10,000 people it costs you nothing I mean a little bit of electricity obviously but you don't have to pay for the platform to publish it on you just invest your time and your thought and after a while you maybe get 10,000 maybe 100,000 readers for whatever you want to say or whatever art you want to produce whatever political campaign you want to start um, the internet gave people gave basically everyone the potential to be an actor again, not to be an object of the, the powerful, an object of the industry, an object of the publishing monopolies. You were in power and that obviously changes how people interact with, with the net. Um, and many people, well, maybe many is a big word, but a few people uh, came to similar conclusions about a little more than a year ago and formed this group that I'm a part of, the Datenschutzkritische Spackeria, because they saw that this, this traditional, let's talk, call it a narrative, that you have to keep everything secret about yourself because there might be pushback. The society might not like that. You might not get a job. The state might hunt you down, whatever. Um, people found out that maybe we should rethink that in this changed networked world, in this world where we can all easily connect and where computers where network technologies where technology in general is no longer just a force that the 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 powers that be have but it is something that we all have or can have if we want to um, and at first it was basically just uh, people meeting and talking to each other and finding out that they are that they are not alone with this impression that things are changing and many very influential groups in Germany, the CCC is is basically the the it's almost a government agency sometimes if you see it like that. They are talking to the biggest, uh, they are talking to the government, they are talking to the biggest legislative bodies, um, and uh, we we kind of got together, talked about it, and after a while, it's not we're not a very formal group, so. The, dialogue always changes and is very fluid, but um, we kind of came to sort of uh, a program that we are working on. And on the one hand, we are trying to, to challenge how the narrative goes today. We try to look at how people use these tools, how do people interact, what are the consequences, and maybe try to challenge how privacy is seen. In Germany, probably because of its history, privacy is seen as a very broad thing. 
Um, in Germany, you don't talk about money, for example. It's one of those things you just don't do. You don't talk about how much money you make. You don't talk about how much other people make. Um, you don't talk about politics. You don't talk about religion. There, there's this huge catalog of basically everything interesting in life is something you're not allowed to talk about in public. Uh, sex, politics, drugs, rock and roll, everything. Um, and we are trying to, to challenge that, that notion and try to see where privacy, if there really is such a thing as, as this, this needed privacy anymore, this, this consensus of privacy, or if that has changed and how that has changed. And on the other hand, we are sort of working on, a, if you can call it a utopia, the, the idea of people living together without, this, this, without privacy, the thinking about how a world would work if people would no longer need to be private and how that would change us, how that might bring us closer together, how that would, for example, change the, the discussion within society. Because uh, nowadays, in Germany, we have this, this, uh, this so-called Tina Prinzip. There is no alternative. Whenever you want, to, you want to push something through, some political decision, you always say, yeah, there is no alternative. And because there is no data, because you don't really know what's going on, people can always just claim that. As soon as people start publishing more about themselves, um, problems get visible and problems can be the dealing with those problems can be enforced. For example, um, for a long time people claimed that homosexuality, those were just a few weird people and they needed treatment and everything would be fine. And the more people went out, the more people came into the open, it was obvious that this is not just a few people. Obviously this is part of our society and we had to force society to deal with this. We had to force society to accept that this is part of society and this is not just some weird uh, sickness that had to be dealt with is just a different part of society that had that was suppressed for such a long time and that that just needed a way to to find a place and we're just working on on ways to find more areas where people can can go into the public with maybe with their problems maybe with their ideas maybe with a new lifestyle maybe with whatever um, right now I see many people for example uh, again a very German discussion so uh, some of you might not have seen that. I see in the German net culture a big movement towards talking about um, problems that you usually do not talk about. Problems like depression, problems like burnout. Um, that discussion is, is uh, coming to the public right now. And I mean, those are things you, everybody would have told you not to talk about. Because if you say, I am depressed, that is bad because if you want to get uh, want to get a new job and you say you're depressed, people might not hire you because, oh, he's depressed, maybe he'll be sick a lot, so let's just hire some other dude. But people are just saying, yeah, fuck it, we go into the open because this is a problem, this is a problem that we as a society have because so many people have this problem and this makes the problem visible and if the problem is visible, we can deal with it. And if the problems are all, all hidden, we cannot deal with it. And if ideas are hidden, we cannot discuss them, we cannot challenge them, and we cannot integrate them in, in our social narrative. So that is basically our program, and uh, I don't want to hog up all the time. So um, I think yeah. uh, Michael has a lot to say about that as well. And um, this is probably the <coughs> momentum of the uh, activists' um, uh, perspective, and Michael brings some structural uh, elements that probably comes to the necessary uh, conclusion that there is n that probably I have the Tina word now that, that there is no alternative to post privacy we will see um, yes um, yeah um, I want to talk about uh, the control verlust what I call the control verlust um, and um, you can hardly translate it into loss of control, but uh, this term is um, really, uh, pretty connected to drugs and alcohol <laughs> in the English language. So um, I um, keep up uh, speaking about control verlust. And uh, I want to, um, yeah, uh, the, the control verlust um, discourse was one of the major um, top, uh, major discussions in the post privacy discourse because it was um yeah the the tina thing um, <laughs> um for for this um uh, necess necessity to 
um, discuss about new alternatives to deal with publicness and privateness and something. So um, I'm um, working. Um, uh, I'm working on my uh, thesis about this topic uh, on my blog um, since about uh, uh, two years. And um, yes, uh, what do I mean with uh, control verlust? Control verlust is um, the. Uh, I try to subsumize different discussions that we um, discuss about the internet and society um, under this one term. And uh, this is a, a discourse about copyright and privacy and uh, things like WikiLeaks. So uh, whenever a musician um, complains about piracy, um, he complains about losing control about the distribution ways uh, for his content. And whenever we complain about privacy, we uh, in reality complain about uh, the loss of control about our self-representation and our personal data and so on, and when governments complain about WikiLeaks and so on. So, um, what are the conditions about uh, of this control verlust, what I'm talking about, and um, in the English language you have a saying that uh, brings this pretty good, um, uh, this w what puts it very pretty good. Uh, you can't unsay things. So uh, when you, whenever you put something out, an information out, you there's no possibility to get it back into the realm of the unknown. And um, we all know this, but um, actually this is not a really digital or internet thing. Uh, we deal with it uh, since dawn of time, but um, so the question has to be what are the specific conditions for loss of control on the internet or in our times in the digital age. And uh, for me, uh, I have to say, uh, I began this discourse um, before I heard about uh, WikiLeaks, but when WikiLeaks come into place, um, it was for me the culmination of uh, this whole idea about losing control about data. And so um, I will refer always to examples from the WikiLeaks history. Um, the first really big um, publish, um, uh, yeah, um, how do you say? Scoop. scoop, yeah, the really big scoop was the video Collateral Murder. Um, you remember perhaps uh, when um, the um, crew on a uh, Apache uh, helicopter attacked uh, unarmed civilians in cold blood and uh, this video was brought to WikiLeaks and it was a real uh, huge scandal and um, what I find interesting at this um, of this situation is that um, the cameras uh, which took the pictures of um, all this were kind of a part of a um, controlling machine uh, for the higher command to control the uh, soldiers uh, in their mission. And, um, but this yeah, controlling machine turned into a loss of control machine, a control verlust machine. And uh, when um, the pictures found its way to WikiLeaks. Um, and I think we have, it's the same that we all have to deal with by now. And uh, at the same time, we had in Germany this um, a big discussion about uh, Google Street View. Um, Google Street View um, um, had uh, in Germany, um, there was a big yeah, privacy concerns about uh, Google Street View, which weren't very um, um, reasonable. But um, I think the thing was that the, um, the the people had um, they, they, they they thought what the fuck the the internet is now uh, driving around my house and taking pictures yeah uh, it was um, the internet coming to my house it was the internet standing in front of my door and taking pictures and I think uh, this was the moment when the people realized hey there's something going on. Um, which uh, always uh, document uh, documents everything and puts it to the internet. And even if I don't deal with the internet myself, um, it will deal with me. And yeah, but the, in reality, um, we are more or less all part of this uh, thing. Uh, when we changed our mobile phones into smartphones, we changed 
it to um, uh, devices with cameras and uh, sensors of all kinds uh, connected to the internet 24-7. And yes, we use it to um, uh, photograph and to um, yeah, take data from everywhere and put it to the internet. So um, the first condition uh, I want to state is uh, the ubiquitous presence of sensors of all kinds. This is uh, the condition one for the control verlust. And this leads to the um, conclusion that if you're a part of the world, you will be part of the internet sooner or later. Yes, and um, um, back to WikiLeaks. Um, when the American government uh, um, began to, find, uh, uh, to fight WikiLeaks, they um, tried to, um, um, to uh, um, bring their partners to, to quit the uh, collaboration with WikiLeaks, like uh, EveryDNS. EveryDNS uh, was the provider, uh, the domain provider, which provided the uh, WikiLeaks.org domain. And um, the government was successful, so they um, quit the uh, collaboration, and uh, WikiLeaks.org wasn't uh, available anymore. But it uh, took only some hours that uh, the internet reacted, uh, people on the internet reacted, and um, um, set up mirrors of WikiLeaks. Uh, mirrors are complete um, copies of the server and all the contents on the server, on different domains and different uh, servers. So um, all the WikiLeaks content was accessible again. And in the on the internet we have a saying for that kind of event and we uh, call it the Streisand effect. Barbara Streisand, you know, all know the actress, um, she once sued uh, the, plan, uh, the website Pictopia.com because um, this website published photos of the yeah, Californian uh, coast side. And in one of these uh, photos, photographs, there was, uh, um, you could see the house of Barbara Streisand and she didn't like it. So she sued the, huh? the house? No, she didn't like the situation, the whole security. Um, so um, uh, she sued uh, Pictopia and um, uh, the suing itself was um, um, the main reason um, everybody uh, got attention to this photograph and everybody um, changed the photograph on the internet and shared the photo on the internet with this uh, little improvement as you can see here <laughs> um, with additional information and so uh, the damage was much more bigger than uh, she uh, if she wouldn't sue it so but um, the main reason for all this is um, that the internet um, is um, based on uh, copy operations. Um, because copy is very basic um, for the internet. Uh, everything we do on the internet is a copying operation. Uh, whenever we send an email, we say we send an email, but in uh, reality we copy the email from our computer to the computer of the um, receiver. When we serve a website, we download the whole website from the server to our um, uh, to our computer and whenever we listen to music, we listen on the music on the computer even if we play it in, on the internet. So the condition number one would be uh, the internet is a huge copy machine. This is condition number one, two, uh, number two for the control fellows. So back to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks um, had his own uh, momentum of uh, losing control. Uh, which is a really funny story because um, 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 this makes kind of um, um, re-entry of the control follows to WikiLeaks. Uh, Julian Assange had all this data, the cables, um, the, the, the cables of the cable gate, um, State Department cables, um, the war logs of uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, and all this data he uh, put it on his server um, on a hidden directory and yes uh, he encrypted uh, the file uh, with a special passphrase um, um, because he didn't want it to publish it um, as raw data he searched for uh, media partners to um, to publish uh, all this stuff and to edit it uh, before publishing because there was critical data there were um, names um, of 
uh, dissidents and uh, other critical information and uh, you had to edit it uh, before you publish it so um, he was on uh, he was searching for partners and um, so he met with journalists and whenever he met with journalists he had to provide access to the raw data so he gave the passphrase to journalists from time to time to tr very trusted journalists and didn't solve a problem in it because he always could uh, change the password and everything would be okay but then um, remember there was this Streisand effect and there were all these copies of um, the server um, on different servers uh, on the world, all over the world. And so um, there was also the hidden directory with the um, with the uh, yeah with the files. And um, yeah, so he he didn't have the possibility anymore to change the passphrase because it was um, somewhere else, and it wasn't under his control anymore and um, but uh, it was still encrypted um, and there uh, the password nobody had the password um, right um, so what could possibly go wrong what went wrong was that David Lai a journalist from the Guardian published a book on WikiLeaks afterwards and um, in the book he published also the passphrase um, yes, uh, it took just a little, uh, a few weeks, I think, um, uh, after a few hackers uh, had uh, uh, decrypted uh, the files and uh, the files were now open for everyone and it was a huge fuck up for WikiLeaks and it was very embarrassing. Um, uh, but uh, I found it a little bit funny. But what I wanted to say with this story is that um, you had two information. Um, information can be harmless as long uh, it is not connected to other information, like the passphrase. Yeah? You can put uh, data on the internet and think it is not um, harmful any, uh, at any way, but uh, then there comes another data, and connected to this data it becomes something else. And this is what we all have to deal with also, because um, um, as I said, there we all document everything now, by now, and so a lot of pictures of ourselves um, is um, going to the internet and we don't even know about that. We all have um, these pictures on the internet, what we don't know about, and uh, at the same time, uh, some companies um, uh, try really hard to improve um, face recognition algorithms. So all these uh, photos, you can um, assume that they will find us. Um, and I think this will um, lead to a lot of nice surprises. What I want to say is that um, in our days, nobody knows what will what data will be tomorrow, um, because in the moment we deal with data and the moment we um, uh, we uh, publish something, uh, we don't know what it will what it it can say about us. So the whole idea of um, informational self uh, self determination, or what is the term in German for the um, for a right for privacy? Um, 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 deals with the idea that uh, we um, actually know what we do when we do something with data, but um, this is uh, not true the first uh, in, in the first place. So the condition number three would be uh, data will be connective, more connective the day after tomorrow than tomorrow, and so we'll say something else tomorrow um, and, to, uh, and the day after tomorrow. So this uh, were the three conditions um, of the control verlust, um, and um, yeah, at the end I wanted to uh, show something, yeah, perspective, um, uh, a little bit uh, the answer to the question: What should we do with this? How do? How should we deal with this situation? Um, uh, first of all, I want to claim that data protection is still necessary, but data protection can all uh, can can 
just can be a retreatment battle. And um, if we deal with data protection, we should assume that it won't help. Um, but we actually have to do in parallel, I think, is to minimize harm, to minimize what, um, what information can do on harm for people. So to make um, um, the people not so much dependent on um, other f um, structures uh, which enforce them um, to live someone else's life or something, to make um, autonomous people, to, to build up um, autonomous people and to enforce uh, autonomy. And um, this means at the end that uh, we have to build a more tolerant society. And uh, this is what um, leads directly back to the idea to of post privacy, uh, which my understanding is that um, this is the approach. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thank you, MS Pro. Just one question is the um, the name of Spackeria. Could you bring the story of how you came to the name, which is so odd? Um, yeah. At uh, the CCC Congress in 2010 or 2009, I think two 2010, uh, one of the speakers, of the official speakers of the CCC, uh, referred to people thinking about post-privacy as post-privacy Spackos. And Spacko in Germany is a very derogative term like idiot or whatever. So um, if somebody who's not of your opinion called you that, you obviously have to adapt that name. I mean, yes, we're idiots maybe, but we're idiots, idiots trying to make something cool. So fine, be it. Um, it's not really translatable. Great. Uh, it's not really a, a great translation. There's not really a great translation for it into English. I mean, it's uh, really just a reaction on this, on the CCC, who's developed into a very conservative thing which it wasn't when it started out. So uh, if they tried to ridicule us, we had to pick that up, I guess. Yeah, this is, I hope I could make this point because then this is the last line and then I will ha hand over to Tatiana. It's the ironic turn that the CCC was found as a technology-friendly organization in a counterculture which was, was technology, Mm, um, avert or had some anxiety and fear of technology, especially uh, the computer and the IT. And after uh, uh, the decades, there is more and more the, the impression that the CCC now and or a certain um, uh, part, a um, uh, relevant part, a significant part of the CCC is now uh, as uh, technology avert and uh, then the original um, uh, counterculture, they were um, differentiating from when they uh, really uh, uh, tried to, um, to associate with this whole rainbow coalition which uh, was uh, then part of the so-called Neue Soziale Bewegung, which is nowadays uh, basically the Green Party. And if you see how the Green Party is now um, uh, uh, is oppressed or is uh, Im impacted by the, the, the Pirate Party, you, s you see uh, this, this dilemma of the technology um, anxiety or technology fear or the this strangeness ag against this whole uh, sphere and uh, yeah this is what i think uh, is really funny because what in the 1970s the, the it was the computer was the f probably the the um the enemy now it is the the internet and the data um um uh, in uh, yeah, the social networks and all the possibilities that are coming with them that uh, uh, 
play the same role 